For decades, buying a silencer has been difficult. But in 2005, Silencer Central set out to simplify the suppressor buying process. So whether you're planning your next hunt or putting together a range day, you'll enjoy every shot you take with Silencer Central, straight to your front door. All right, guys. Um, welcome to the Black Rifle Coffee podcast. Special guest, Chad Robichaud. If you haven't heard of Chad, follow the links below because I've podcasted Chad on his personal experiences on Phil Craft Survival's podcast, my company's podcast. Um, one of the reasons I have Chad here is Chad is an amazing human being. I mean, there's very few people, probably a handful of people, that I would categorize as an amazing human being. Um, and what I mean by that is philanthropically, Chad's life is committed to helping people, um, but not just in a conventional sense, in a very unconventional sense. Um, he's not just talking on social media about issues. He's literally going into harm's way to help people. Um, one of the controversial things recently that's been taking place in the news that all of you guys know about is Ukraine. I mean, um, we're committing a lot of money to Ukraine uh, with not a lot of clear uh, strategy or objective. Um, but Chad knows all of the ground truth because he spent a lot of time in Ukraine. How many trips you got to Ukraine now? Uh, 10 since February. 10 yeah. since February. Yeah. That is not today's podcast because before he started venturing into Ukraine to help the humanitarian crisis and all the things that were going on, he was running Save Our Allies and one of the many, um, oh, I wouldn't say many, one of the few that were actually making profound change and rescuing people um, with that organization, which is Chad is the, the founder of Save Our Allies, to help get guys and gals that have worked for us, American citizens, et cetera, out of harm's way during the fall of Afghanistan. Let's just call it what it is. It's, it was the fall, uh, including one of the guys that he worked with in a classified program that he ran for Joint Special Operations Command. I could say that, right? Yeah. Just that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're going to get into that story. I, I'm, I'm prefacing all of this because um, the focus of this is going to be saving Aziz. Uh, the following podcast, the kind of the follow up to this, is our Mission Resilience podcast, which I'll I'll um, uh, send you links to that as well. That's focused on Ukraine. We we don't have enough time in the day to kind of uh, get to both. So today's focus is going to be saving Aziz. Chad, thanks for making the trip out here, man. Oh, of course, man. Like, podcast or not, it's great to see you. Yeah, it's great yeah. to see you as well. We we. I mean, we're very bit. Both of us are very busy, but it's yeah. it's awesome to see you, uh, regardless. Especially Benny and Penny up there getting. I know, <laughs> getting big. Yeah, yeah, they're getting huge. We, uh, Chad hasn't seen my kids in a but what about a year? It's been yeah, about a year. Yeah, yeah, in there. Uh, um, let's talk about um, Aziz. Who who is Aziz? Aziz is one of the most remarkable human beings I know. Uh, he came on as an interpreter uh, on our on our JSOC task force. Uh, he has an incredible backstory. We could do a whole podcast just on his backstory, but started learning English on his own when he was eight years old, taught himself English, started teaching English in the underground as a teenager because he's a hustler. Mm. He had like 800 students at like 14 years old. Taliban caught him. He, uh, he would have been killed by the Taliban. He had to leave, uh, went to Dubai, uh, so he fled. His family uh, got, snuck him out of Afghanistan, fled to Dubai. When the 9-11 happened, it was his opportunity to come back and 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 uh, helped to liberate his country. And so he joined U.S. Special, Oper US Special Forces first and then went on the cars, then went on the detail for the presidential detail. Um, as a we, translator, as I assume. As a translator, yeah. yeah. And then uh, it was on the anti-terrorism task force and then we picked him up as an interpreter. He, he was highly vetted and, uh, and proved to be you know, more than just interpreter. So we trained him and he ended up being my team, late, team member. As a singleton, I worked uh, directly with Aziz hundreds of missions through Afghanistan, cross-border into Pakistan. Uh, so as a lot of people imagine, you know, special operations work, a lot of people don't know what AFOs are, and I know we got to talk about, you, you got to point people back to my backstory, but as an AFO, going forward, going forward with the assaulters, doing all the clandestine logistics, Aziz was the guy with me. And uh, so the two of us spent, you know, months uh, together, the two of us out in the mountains, living together. When we came back, I didn't go to base, and he went home. I went home to his house. Uh, his wife, Hatra, you know, cooked me meals. I, I was there when his oldest son, my, my shoot and my shoot daughter was born. And, 
you know, followed his six kids being born. And so he's part of my family. Like, I love this guy. He's my brother. And, and, uh, you know, he's, uh, saved my life multiple times. I always say he saved my life on three occasions specifically, but, uh, but I would say he saved my life every day. Like, don't walk there. Don't eat that. Don't talk to that person. If you talk right now, they're going to kill us. Like he saved my life every day. And he's like, most probably the most brave person ever seen most patriotic person uh with this understanding of freedom that most americans don't even have as an afghan who never even seen freedom uh and just understands the cause of freedom so much won it so badly for his daughters to be able to go to school and right now it's so cool to see his daughters going to school and and uh and, and here in texas so he's just an incredible human being and it was my afghan interpreter was my teammate most importantly he's my friend so. Yeah, the the um, the unique story of the time that uh, Chad spent operating with disease. Um, it, we talk about that in the last podcast on that Phil Kraus Survival podcast. But what, what stood out to me is, you know, as a person who kind of operated in a singleton capacity, um, you had to trust this guy with your life every single day, literally. And he proved that <laughs> over time. Yeah, and and. Uh, the tragedy in Chad's story, like a lot of Afghans who worked with American Special Operations, a lot of the guys that you worked with, that you stood up, that you vetted, that you recruited, that you worked with daily were killed, right? Yeah. We, so we had this operation going, uh, you know, I can't get into details of the operation, but one of the guys flipped OGA trained guy. Uh, we had, we had 12 of them together. Um, one of them flipped, uh, to the Taliban. Don't, we don't know why, uh, his name was Bashir. He, uh, told the Taliban about this operation. 12 of our teammates were killed, captured and killed two Americans, 10 Afghans. They tried to get, go specifically after Aziz cause he was, cause of his, the level of his position to kill him. They drove a V bed into my house, a vehicle ID into my home, uh, killed our, our guard. Uh, luckily none of our team members were killed. Uh, and, um, uh, and then turned me into a, a foreign intelligence agency, which I, I ended up being abducted by a foreign intelligence agency for, for, for a period of, of a day, which doesn't sound long, but trust me, it was, it was long, yeah. long for me. And, uh, and so our command actually caught this guy, Bashir, uh, arrested him when they arrested him. He had all the plans, like where we slept, where our beds were, how much money we had when we moved our, our, our deviating our route, routes and, and times, like all that he had it all laid out for months. Uh, so when they caught him, he had all that. He went to the Bagram jail, uh, and then he eventually went to the Saudi to jail. He was part of the prisoner release uh, when President Obama came in office. He was he'd spent a little bit more time in jail, and then get ended up getting released. Went to the Taliban, and now when the Afghan evacuation starts happening, and 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 the President Biden announces the withdrawal, Bashir comes back to Kabul and starts looking for all of our old teammates that are still around mainly Aziz. And so we had to, so back in like, maybe like uh, May, June, we had to start moving Aziz and he was on the run because Bashir was looking for him. As, uh, Aziz had already been the SIV special immigrant visa process for his visa for six years. His process in 2009, we did the, we did the agreement for SIVs that was supposed to, supposed to take nine months if they contractually fulfilled their obligation as interpreters to us. It was only supposed to take nine months. Aziz, this guy did 15 years at the highest level of special operations, polygraphed, vetted, like we know who he is, six years in this process and we couldn't get him out. And, uh, and so as we're moving Aziz and I'm watching this thing unfold, I'm like, man, we're going to have to, that's when I start talking to you, Tim Kennedy. I, I called, uh, I called Richard McGinnis at, at Tucker Carlson, uh, daily wire. And I said, Hey, I want to put it together a operation where we're going to go in as media and, and, and uh, you guys will get the underground story of what's going on in Afghanistan, but I'm going to get Aziz out through this. And Richard McGinnis, he's, he's the guy that was undercover with Antifa and stuff. He was like, heck, right over, rock, rock, rock on, let's do it. Yeah. And so that's originally what we were going to do to go get Aziz out, but everything just happened so fast. Yeah. With the evacuations. Yeah. So, so you, you guys understand, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there, which is one of the reasons I love podcasts because we can mm -hmm. actually get in the weeds of things versus clickbait and, and miss and disinformation. Um, a lot of people thought when Save Our Allies, which included Tim Kennedy and yourself as the as personalities, yeah, they thought that that was um, a rogue operation of just two yeah. dudes jumping on a plane and then willy nilly causing issues on the ground, and that's contrary to the truth, right? Yeah, I mean, first of all, like it's ridiculous that any, if anybody ever paused and thought for a minute. 
that it was actually possible for two veterans to go and just get just planes, show just show up, get planes, land on the U.S. DOD controlled airport and start going outside the wire, loading people in planes, taking them through military control gates and evacuating people. If anybody thinks that's actually possible, then they're too stupid to even have a conversation with. I mean, yeah. I mean, and this is, and I'm saying it's too stupid. This is people from our community Absolutely. that were stupid enough to believe that. Yeah. Like, and they're I'm like, like <laughs> I heard from the Marines and Tim Kennedy screwing up things. It's like. Are you? Where are you right now? Like, like how, how much? Like, how much power do you think I have to be able to evacuate people from another country? With a C seventeen that to, you brought in, <laughs> yeah, to another country. So I mean, we had the Joint Chiefs gave us permission to go in there. Uh, when under General Milley, who you know I know we're not a fan of, but he, he did give us permission to go there. Yeah, uh, they agreed to uh, through Sarah Verado that every name that we put on our rescue list to put on our so our people were vetted. And we, uh, we were able to bring them to a third-party country to where the State Department could vet and, and, uh, and validate people to come out. So, yeah, this is not willy-nilly at all, uh, not a rogue operation. Everything was coordinated with the DOD, the Joint Chiefs, uh, State Department, who was not a fan, by the way, of what we were doing, but had to work with us because we wouldn't do anything illegal. Just in a snapshot, because we're, we're on the topic, what is your overall impression with the disaster that was this evacuation, what, what was your perspective from the ground of all the things that you saw as a sum up? Well, I'll start with this. The lie that the American people have been led to believe, and most of us probably at some point believed it, is that we were in a 20-year war that was an endless war and we had to pull out at some time. And if we did it right or wrong, it had to happen eventually. That is a lie mm -hmm. that's just not true. Uh, first of all, you have to look at the... At Afghanistan and where it's at strategically in the globe. It is the most strategic place on the globe in today's current world between Iraq, Iran, Russia, and China. Bagram Air Force Base is the most coveted military installation on the planet. And, uh, and because for of the us, time of flight to all these strategic locations where these countries hate us. Precisely, yeah. yeah. And for us to give that up wasn't ours to give up. Uh, the United States of America did not just control that. We were in an international effort with uh, all of our international allies, and it was actually working where, uh, you know, countries like Britain and, and Germany and everybody was participating to come there and do this unified effort to uh, support and advise the Afghan National Army and Afghan National P Police, the ANA and the ANP, to fight the Taliban and keep them at bay in those mountains of Afghanistan to keep the world safe, to keep our national security safe. So to, to say that we needed to move out at one time 2,500 troops, but during the evacuation, 4,000 troops from Afghanistan to to in this endless war is ridiculous. Uh, I mean, look at World War II. We still have we still have eighty thousand troops in Japan since World War II because that model worked. We still have uh, troops uh, since the Korean War. In we had thirty five hundred thirty five thousand troops in South Korea still because it works to have that presence in Germany. We still have forty thousand troops to lead to t pull out twenty five hundred to four thousand troops from Afghanistan to end the endless war. A twenty year war is completely ridiculous. Uh, it's political, and there was there was. Uh, alternative motives behind players that we can't see and don't know that, you know, we could go into a whole nother podcast of conspiracies between who's, who's, who's to gain most. Uh, I'll just say in a snapshot, who's the gain most was, was China, China and Russia. Uh, I mean, uh, China, Russia and, and Iran were the three countries that gained the most by uh, us leaving there. And uh, mainly China, Iran, uh, as well for the oil, both get oil to China. The only thing sitting between China and Russia, China and Afghanistan, the only thing sitting between China and Iran is Afghanistan and U.S. military needed to get that embargo oil to China. And mm. then, uh, you know, China wanted the base. They wanted, Bagram, they wanted Bagram Air Force Base. So did ISI in Pakistan. All enemies benefited from us leaving there. The international community was not consulted. Not one country was consulted. The Afghan government that we put in place for 20 years was not consulted with. The only people that negotiated the withdrawal of Afghanistan was the United States government and our enemy of 20 years, the Taliban. Those are the only people that I negotiated with. And, and I, under the Trump administration, because Biden's excuse was this was already administratively uh, committed. Mm -hmm. But from my understanding, Trump didn't commit to a full withdrawal. He committed to a, a withdrawal of troops on the front line. Yep. And then obviously having, just like we have in Iraq, mm -hmm. having a task force or a joint task force that's co-located with an international community 
to keep a signature there, right? Yeah, and you know, from what I understand, and, and it's, it's the position I took in this book, that, uh, and, and this is not grandstanding for President Trump or anything like that, this is just the facts of how it laid out. President Trump was not going to forfeit Bagram Air Force Base, it was going to still be an international hub to, to, to fight terrorism, you know, and, uh, and so we would have been able to support and advise the Afghan National Army from there, just like we do in, like you said, Iraq, uh, Africa, all over the world. Uh, in, in addition, the Doha agreement would have been held to where the Taliban would have not been allowed to do any terrorism there. Uh, uh, it w and any terrorism would have re responded in, you know, anti-terrorist effort. Uh, that's what the Doha agreement's about. So that Doha agreement now, which is, uh, has been instituted, I think two weeks after Pre President Biden came in office, is a complete joke. It says that the Taliban in, in, in exchange for this agreement will not conduct terrorism. Well, they are terrorists. Uh, and by the way, yeah. I was I was a hardy was there like a month later, yeah. <laughs> walking around Kabul, standing on his balcony, and yeah. they were they were high fiving each other for killing him. Uh, I, I don't want to know that he was killed because he should have been killed. I want to know why he was there. Yeah, why, he was there because we we created a hotbed for terrorism. Yeah, and uh, we're not learning the lesson, right? And then yeah. I love the narrative that it's like we're ending this brutal war, in uh, this narrative that it's so dangerous, troops are dying. In the same period of time, more law enforcement officers were killed in the country than soldiers killed overseas. And it's like, man, we it, it seemed like we had it in a good position and we gave all that up rapidly. Mm -hmm. And then guys like you, which I, I think the right answer is private citizens kind of managing these kind of uh, catastrophes. Because every war, even World War II, um, civilian interaction and civilian consulting and civilian civilians were the difference between winning and losing, whether it was logistically with KBR, um, call it what you want, but without the civilian free market place, you, you wouldn't have uh, the flexibility for you and Tim to roll in there and actually do good work. <laughs> Because the institution is so constrained. Yeah, I mean, this is my wife's question. Why are you going to do this? Like, there's younger guys that are still doing this. Why are you going to do this now at you know at 46 years old? And and I'm like, well, they're, they're not allowed to do it. They're they're within limitations. And so the next best thing yeah. is veterans. And in fact, I, I feel like it was better because I've been in the military. I was in the military a long time. I was at a high level of special operations like you were. I, I it is, it would have been uh, logistically and and policy wise impossible to execute in the in the in the rapid time frame that we executed to pull that off, it would have been impossible to both pull it off in the military, even at those high level units. Of course. Uh, yeah. It would just, it just would have not been possible to pull it off. We, we didn't have the restraints. We were able to say, Hey, we're going to do some of this on the fly. And, uh, you know, we, and, and, and by the way, what happened and, you know, taking a step back now, what happened when, you know, was going to get Aziz, that was the original thing put together, called, called you, called Tim, called some guys I knew from the veteran community that had high-level special operations experience who had like ASO or AFO-level backgrounds, uh, mature people who wasn't looking to go out and get their, get their itch scratched because they didn't have the courage to do it in the last 20 years. Yeah. Uh, you know, because there was a lot of guys out there that were like, hey, man, I want to go out there and get some. It's like, the getting some's over. Yeah. Like, we're going to help people. We're not going to fight. I'm not looking to, I didn't want to bring anybody that was looking. So I was looking for guys that already got that out of their system because that's not what we're going there for. Yeah. Um, and so I got these guys together and, and man, the most incredible group of guys. There's one guy uh, that literally worked his whole life, Green Beret, Delta Force, CAA, Ground Branch, Maritime Branch, his whole life, that's what he wanted to do. He stepped away from that job to be able to participate in this effort because it's the right thing to do. Like he walked away from it walked away forever? Because he wouldn't have been allowed to do it. Uh, yeah. So he had, to, he had to resign to do it. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, he lost that, that career that he worked his whole life to be it. I'm not talking about a contractor like... It's like guys, a PMO, a paramilitary officer, and like he's just uh, he's like there's a bigger cause here. Yeah, this is this is this is our this is what I did all this for was to, to help these people, mm. and uh, so and most amazing people. And while we're planning for Aziz, that you know these guys are like, hey, there's a lot more than Aziz out there. Aziz's wife and six kids are great, but there's Americans, there's women, the, uh, ch women and children, there's Christians that are gonna be persecuted, there's more interpreters. Let's get as many people as we can. And and at that point, I believe that. You know, you know me, I'm a strong person of faith. I believe God burdened my heart and burdened the hearts of all of us to say, we're going to lean forward, not knowing how we're going to get this done, and we're, we're going we're gonna to help these people. And, uh, and from that decision, uh, I believe God does these amazing things when you make a decision of obedience to, to move forward and that, that burden that you have on your heart, that these doors opened. And, uh, and I, I believe I witnessed it like a divine miracle because in, in three days after the decision, um, we got permission from the Joint Chiefs 
to go in that, that, that airport and was the only civilians. A lot, there's a lot of people mad at us because they couldn't get on the airport and they blamed us because we were the only civilians in the airport. But the truth is the joint chiefs gave us permission. Uh, we can't help. They didn't get permission. Other people, they gave it to us. Uh, uh, we were, we were able to have them agree to manifest our, our list. We got, we called the United Arab Emirates. One of our team members there, Joe Robert had a, had a family. He's a recon Marine that had personal connections to the Royal family called there and said, Hey, this is what we want to do. Can we bring these people to you? Because we can't, Again, this goes back to our, our inability to do this. We can't just take people out of a country. Where do we bring them to? We don't have visas. They have to go to a humanitarian center. So the United Arab Emirates, the royal family said, yes, you can bring them here. Not only can you bring them here, we're going to give you a humanitarian center. We're going to give you C-17 planes. And if you fill those up, we'll give you more. Uh, and we're going to have doctors and food. And we're going to take care of the kids and br bring them here. We're going we're gonna to participate. Uh, and then Glenn Beck called and Glenn Beck wanted to step up and do something. The only thing he has is this, this microphone. And he's like, got under, he thought he raised a couple of thousand dollars. Uh, he ended up raising $46 million. But by the time he called me, he had raised $21 million. And he's like, I raised all this money. I didn't know I was going to raise it because people want to help because uh, people are amazing and want to do something about this because it was the, you know, what was happening was wrong. And uh, he's like, what do I do with the money? And I'm like, you're going to start buying planes and we're going to start putting people on them. And, uh, and so in three days, all that happened. That's why wow. I say it's a miracle. Uh, wow. I'm not I'm not smart enough, capable enough to do that. And and we went in and, and uh, in that ten day period, I mean, so much. We got his ease. We got his family. Uh, I was kind of coordinating a lot of stuff from Abu Dhabi, manifesting, uh, building these uh, target packages. Coordinated all our ground team was a guy named Sean G. C. Spray. Tim Kennedy went on our ground team outside the wire. We put we moved the team onto people. Get them out. Get them inside the inside the airport. And then manifest them, get them vetted and flown to Abu Dhabi. We were moving like, like a thousand people a day. We had no idea how many people were moving because it was going so fast. Everybody, the team in Abu Dhabi, the team in Kabul, like no one slept. Like Sea Spray lost thirty-seven pounds in, in ten days. Wow! Like because you just if you stop to sleep for five minutes, you like somebody just died because I slept for five minutes. Yeah, yeah. And so it was like that kind of environment. And uh, and then when the Abu Gate blew up, thirteen of our service members were were killed. Uh, the military started welding the gate shut. And uh, we knew that we knew at that moment the military had to leave, but it goes to to your point: the military had to leave, but we didn't have to leave. The yeah. veterans didn't have to leave because we were not confounded by the by the White House or the government saying we had to leave. And and the media, mainstream media, because the White House said there was a hundred Americans left, maybe a hundred Americans left. We knew that there were probably thousands of Americans still on the ground. And by the way, like it doesn't matter if there's a thousand or hundred. Like you and I know, we don't leave. A, an American behind even some idiot trader like Joe Birdall will like we're gonna go get you right that's the promise we have to the American people yeah. literally I will scorch the earth to go get that person even if it means losing team, mem team members you don't leave 100 Americans behind that's, as the White House said we were gonna do much less we knew those thousands so we I, I personally couldn't conscious in my good conscience leave uh, and I think everybody felt the same way on our team and we, so we chose to stay and there was and, and when we went there that, at that time we had rescued 12,000 people and uh, at, over the next two months, we worked with so many organizations like Task Force Argo and, and, and uh, you know, the Pineapple Express was still coordinating people from back here. Uh, there was there was so many organizations. I know that's when we got your interpreter out in that second thing. Yeah. We, ended up, we ended up getting another 5,000 people out through Maza Sharif. And then when that was over, then we knew we had to, that's when we moved over to the, you know, cross border, trying to move people cross border. Yeah. But, I so, so you guys know, I mean, this was a, this whole time, that this was taking place, um, we didn't really talk about it because I, you know, the, the, it was very sensitive in in the nature. I didn't know if these guys were coming back, and you know, I was talking with Tim on chats, just getting live updates and tracking the status, and I was kind of on standby to like fly out, and then also my interpreter who reached out to me and was like, "I don't want to die." Um, both Save Our Allies and another organization which I don't think exists now, helped me get him out. But that it, I felt like I was back in special operations working in a talk, a tactical operations center. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was on reverse cycle. Me, me and Amber, one of my employees who helped me with it through this process, it was so insane to be chatting with my interpreter, former special operations commanders, like special forces commander, who I positioned in that position. Like he was just a guy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this guy could be an Afghan commando. And not only that, he's shown leadership. He should be the guy in charge. I put him in charge. 
he got left he got separated from his son because I told him to send his son uh, and his family together and I'm talking to his son and and his son's like 17 years old he's like Mr. Mike the five people in front of me they just pulled out because the Taliban is starting to pull people out of line and I'm like in the middle of this going dude I, I need you to leave yeah. like go away yeah. Just take your family and move, and I'm, and then I don't hear from him for for a couple hours, and like we are safe, we're is, back at the hotel. Yeah, is he alive? Is he not? Is he dead? And it's yeah. like I think, people I think don't I understand. Told you, I think that's when I told you to move him to Mazda Sharif or something like that. Yes, yeah, yeah. we started yeah. we started through covert comms, working through different channels and rat lines, trying to establish the best routes to these guys because a lot of these guys were getting rolled up by the Taliban mm -hmm. because they were getting compromised, and this whole thing was a disaster. When you when you left the country, how many Americans did we know we were leaving behind? And when we left, as the the government left, was there anybody left behind to take care of anybody? No. When the, so when the, when the last military plane left and was wheels up, the United States government had no presence there. Wow. Uh, and and they were and they were, and, and in my assessment, this isn't my opinion. This isn't a shot at the White House. In my on the ground assessment, uh, there were there were well over a thousand, I'd say thousands of Americans still there. Uh, hiding because they were you have to understand strategically what happened the um, the neo operation the non-combatant evacuation operation is a dod function mm -hmm. yep. department of defense function when civilians or, or or people that we care about allies are in a combat environment and we need to evacuate them the dod handles the non-combatant evacuation it's called the neo and uh and that operation was taken away by from the dod by the white house directly by the commander-in-chief and given to the State Department. It's not their job. There's a reason that there's military strength and diplomacy separated. Uh, and because, you know, it's, and when that happened, it was like, okay, you guys are both on an airplane, so we're gonna put the, the flight attendant in the pilot seat. It's gonna crash, and that's what happened. They, they put the, the, the State Department in charge of the new operation. The State Department used the, used the United States military as embassy security. They, they took control of the airport, and as they took control of the airport, the military was out of security, and they never didn't allow them, just like an embassy, to go outside the wire. They wasn't allowed. They could have seen an American getting killed right in front of them, and they couldn't do anything about it. They could shoot, but they couldn't leave that 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 position of of that place. So there was. So the reason that's important to understand with why Americans were left behind is because now the Taliban had the outer perimeter of the airport, and. Anybody that understands combat knows whoever tro controls the outer perimeter controls that ground space. Anybody that went inside or outside of the airport was only allowed to by the Taliban. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. and, and That's and, bizarre. Like the idea that I, I heard one of these generals on, on C-SPAN say, so we have this set up and he's like literally briefing it and he's briefing that the Taliban have the outer cordon. Yeah. And I'm right. like, what? <laughs> we don't control that ground space. And then and then and then we're surprised when a V bid goes off on the inner compound because the Taliban let it because the Taliban <laughs> let them in. Yeah, they're like, oh, that wasn't Taliban. That was I IS. It's it, it matter who it is. It was a, it was Taliban. The Taliban let it through. It's insane <laughs> to me. I, like it, the whole thing to me. What's what's dumbfounding to me, Chad, is after all is said and done. Mm -hmm. And 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 we're still like I just read a headline last week where it said the Taliban is not allowing women to go to school and it was a headline and I'm like yeah. that's a headline <laughs> yeah. that's did like you, did you normal. not know that was gonna happen <laughs> did you not know that was gonna happen that's normal yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't understand how there's not been anybody held accountable for that it, it like if that was a military operation mm -hmm. and the commander the ground force commander the assault force commander. Anybody in charge of anything that took place, mm -hmm. just like with Africa, when four mm -hmm. third group guys got killed, mm -hmm. heads rolled. Right, people's careers were ruined, and people were fired, justifyingly in mm -hmm. some cases. But in this case, the biggest disaster in recent military history, and nothing happened. Yeah, in the book, uh, I, I had to, of course, send it to the Pentagon, and the Pentagon redacted. Uh, you know, it took five months there at the Pentagon. They redacted things and they went to every, all the different agencies uh, that I've worked with in the past. And but but they redacted some things that uh, protect the White House making some bad decisions that I would I would I would argue are not classified. Uh, they're just things that sh that they don't want the American public to know about that that withdrawal. And uh, I can't even allude to what those are because obviously they redacted. And, yeah. And, uh, but um. But uh, you know, it's unfortunate. I, uh, so political opinion, political opinion has been based on a ground 
perspective mm-hmm. was redacted in the book. Yeah. Yep. That's insane. And, and I assume I, I left I left all all redactions in black. Say, okay. Yep, so so can, it's blocked out so you can make yeah. you can contextualize. I shorten some of them cuz some of the redactions were like this big and I didn't want a bunch of big black but but yeah, yeah every, every everywhere there's a redaction is, is put in there. Black Rifle Coffee Company set out on a mission to make the best cup of coffee that's ever hit your mug. The dream was to sell enough premium coffee to be able to build a support network of veterans, first responders and law enforcement. Thanks to your support all that dream has become a reality. Black Rifle Coffee is roasted by a veteran-led team of brilliant coffee graders here in the United States who work tirelessly to roast and bag the highest quality coffee right here in America. The coffee is truly one of a kind, but it's your support that gets the gear, funding, and supplies into the hands of those on our front lines. This year alone, your support has helped BRCC expand our team of active duty service members, veterans, and veteran family members. Black Rifle was also able to donate over 120,000 bags of coffee to veterans and first responders in 2022, all thanks to you. You can purchase at BlackRifleCoffee.com. You can also find Black Rifle Coffee in grocery and convenience stores near you. Black Rifle Coffee, America's coffee. For decades, buying a silencer has been difficult. But in 2005, Silencer Central set out to simplify the suppressor buying process. So what happens when you buy from Silencer Central? Well, they help you find the right silencer for you, they handle the paperwork so you don't have to, and they give you a free NFA gun trust so you can share your suppressor. Silencer Central allows you to pay while you wait. They make sure your purchase is carefully prepped, packaged, and protected until the moment you're approved. Once approved, they deliver it straight to your door. So whether you're planning your next hunt or putting together a range day, you'll enjoy every shot you take with Silencer Central straight to your front door. Uh, how long uh, does that process normally take? About, uh, probably about 45 days. Uh, and it took me five months. So, so it was just in time for the miss the, that my book would have to be pushed back to miss the midterms. Of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Which just obviously took place in November. Um, this book releases next week. And tell me about the reason you wanted to write this book. Well, uh, the truth needs to be told. Uh, I mean, look, I've written books to sell books before. Uh, I mean, but pretty much every book I've, I've written has had a purpose behind it, a cause behind it to help people. How many books have you written? Uh, I think this is a, a number eight. Jeez, number eight. what? Yeah. Dude, yeah. book writing is the hardest <laughs> thing I've ever done it, it's, in my it's life. Hard, yeah. It's, it's hard. insane. I had a lot of help, and, and David Thomas helped me with this because I only had like 10 weeks to write this. Yeah. Uh, and uh, David Thomas, the New York Times bestselling author, Thomas Nelson said, hey, we want to get somebody to help you write it. And uh, we worked together in tandem and, and got it knocked. And I was journaling the whole time because yeah. early on I was like, this has to be told. Yeah. So I, I, I journal a lot anyway. So I was journaling the whole time. And uh, so, you know, took my journal notes and put it in. But essentially what the book is, is it's a, it's a chron- chronological, that's just some of the best stuff's the second half, but it's a chronological series of events of my relationship with disease when we met, our, a little bit of our time together, our time apart, the withdrawal and how the withdrawal took place. And, and uh, I try not to be partisan politically in it, but I just want to tell the truth. And I think the American people in the world needs to know the truth about what happened there because there's so much misinformation out there. In addition, um, I think people need to have hope and, and, and be encouraged that when the governments of the world fail, good people will stand up and do the right thing. Yeah, and, and that's what we've seen in this. I mean, the people that, there's people on my social media like yours that, that follow me just because they hate me and they bash everything I say. They were like, hey, I don't like you, but what you're doing right now is a good thing. Where could I donate money? Like mm-hmm. literally, like I was getting messages like that from like like left wing, like people that like hate hate me because I was, you know, I'm a conservative and believe in conservative values. They were like, yeah, we don't like each other, but right now I wanna, I wanna, I wanna help. What you're, wow. doing, what you're doing is awesome. We had a Jewish organization wanna pay for two planes. It, it, was, it was pretty crazy how this happened. They, they wanted to pay for two planes. One was 800,000, one was 700,000, so $1.5 million. And uh, Mighty Oaks, my, my foundation, Mighty Oaks Foundation is a Christian organization, and that's where we we're doing the money through. And so the Jewish guys uh, gave the wire information. They went to wire the money and a guy calls me and he says, hey, we can't make the, the, the wire transfer. And I'm like, did I give you the number wrong? Like, what's, what's up? And he's like, uh, he's like, no, you guys are a Christian organization. We're a Jewish organization. We can't give you know, Jewish money to a Christian organization. I'm like, okay, cool. But do you know we are rescuing like Muslims, right? And he just like, <laughs> la- he just like laughed. And he's like, yeah, okay, let's do it. And it, it was like this beautiful moment where like all that was put aside, like, a Jewish organization gave money to a Christian organization to rescue, to rescue Muslims. Muslims to show the love of, of, you know, and as a Christian, like it's showing the love of God to the people that might not believe what I believe and, and just doing the right thing. That's and, awesome. Uh, and man. it was, it was, there was a, and 
a lot of people have asked us, you know, I mean, why would you like, why'd you do that? Like what? And, and uh, I mean, it, it was just the right thing to, it was just the right thing to do. I mean, obviously me, I was selfishly motivated for Aziz at first, but then there was a point moment. It was like, no one's going to help these people. Like these people are going to die. Like 40 million people are going to be put on the Taliban rule. 20 million women are immediately going to be sex slaves. Like no one's going to help these people. Somebody has to help. And like, you know, guys give me a background, a platform to be able to platform, to be able to raise resources, pull resources together, uh, a background in the operations. I'm like, I have to help. Like we have, we have to, we have to do it. And I think everyone involved felt that way. And, uh, it was just the right thing to do. We were getting interviewed recently, not about this, but about Ukraine and, uh, and me and sea spray, who's an incredible human being. And, and, uh, this interviewer said, ask that question, why are you doing this? And he said, you know, cause it's the right thing to do. But then she asked another question. She said, is it worth it? And, uh, I had never heard that before. Like, is it worth it? And he, and he said, it doesn't have to be, um, which I think is pretty complex for a lot of Americans, right? It doesn't have to be worth it to do the right thing. That's not, don't always have to be an ROI, like yeah. or a guarantee of safety or like, like yeah. sometimes, sometimes you just do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. It doesn't have to be worth it. Oh, interesting. <laughs> There's no value. There doesn't have to be a value metric or a return yeah. on your investment. But most of the decisions the you make right are thing. that, right? Yeah. yeah. It's like, what are we getting out of this? It's yeah. like, Hey, you're not getting anything. They're just the right thing to do, right? This is the guy that gave up his career, you know? Yeah. Is, is it worth it? We just said it doesn't have to be. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I, what I find uh, Im- impressive now, um, post this experience, um, spoiler alert, Aziz is home, at least his home away from home, in Texas, correct? He's in Texas. He's in Texas. He's got cowboy boot, cowboy hat. He, <laughs> says, he says, y'all. <laughs> it's, it's the most amazing thing. Like, they have totally embraced. Like, I've taken him to do all the first time things. Like, first hamburger, first fishing trip, first pizza. Oh, like, so All the cool. first time things. And I took him skydiving. He's like, he's like, Afghans don't do stuff like that, by the way. And he's yeah. like, he's like, he's, he's about to go. skydiving? Yeah, like three times now. Oh, my. And, and I'm, 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 I jumped with him. That came with tandem, but I like fl- orbited around him and stuff. Yeah. And uh, it's, so he's like, he's like about to go at the plane the first time. And he's like, dude, you, you took me from Afghanistan to kill me in Texas. <laughs> Is this <laughs> whole family? Did this whole his, family make Yeah, it? his wife and six kids. And and then his one of the, this cool, you think this is cool. Like I, I said, his wife was at work. And I'm like, what's your wife doing at work? Hotcha, what's Hotcha at work for? He's like. Cause I'm like, I'm paying, I, you're good, right? You need any extra money? He's like, no, she's at work. Where's she working? She's working at McDonald's. I'm like, dude, what is your wife working at McDonald's for? Like, <laughs> you need money? Like, like, cause we were like really helping him out, you know? And he's, and he's like, no, she went to work. I'm like, well, let's get her a job somewhere else. He's like, no, you don't understand. She wanted to work at McDonald's. Like his wife and his daughter wanted to work at McDonald's. Cause it was like a privilege, like an American thing to be able to work at McDonald's and ser- serve McFlurries. <laughs> they, they just did it for like two months, but they wanted the experience of yeah. working at McDonald's. Yeah. For it's like them, American it's a labor thing. of love and they're actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, they're, they're excited to work in America. Yeah. When most Americans are like, Ugh, <laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. Chick-fil-A is a step up though. It um, is, yeah. So how, how are they assimilating to the whole experience? Oh man, it's so awesome. You know, it, for me, it was like personally, like so rewarding because his, his kids are so brilliant and smart and they speak good English and they, and, for, you know, his one of the things we, you know, when he, we were back in Afghanistan in the early days, he's like, I want my daughters, I want my daughters to be in a country where they go to school, like, and be equal. Like, he's never, he's just always have been, like, very, uh, like I said, really understood freedom uh, from a way that most Americans don't. And, he, and so to see his daughters going to school and have the opportunity like that is just, like, they've totally embraced it. They're doing really well. Uh, he goes, you know, him and his family go to church with us every Sunday. Um, so cool come barbecues at our house kids playing in the pool first thing they said when they got back to America uh, my, my wife was like what do you guys want to do Disneyland what do you want to do they're like we want to swim in the, we want to go swimming in a swimming pool because they never swam in a swimming pool wow, before man. we're like we just built one in our backyard and they stripped so down in their underwear awesome. and they jumped in our pool and we swam for a couple hours that's they were like, so one rad, of them man. Couldn't even swim. He's like drowning. He can swim now. But <laughs> it's so <laughs> profound. I mean, how profound is that? That yeah. six children of a man you worked with overseas fighting terrorism in his own country, helping America. His six beautiful children get the opportunity to live the rest of their lives in wow. freedom. And so we were talking. We were in a deer stand the other morning. It was like six degrees out, and we were like freezing, and we were like. Dude, can you believe we're here? Like, he's like, he's like, and no one's shooting back, brother. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, this is so awesome. Like, in deer stand in Texas. Oh my like, god, it was, man, it's it so, so so surreal. Yeah, like, and, and you know, when when we first got him out, uh, he he told me I'm allowed to share the story. Um, 
So when I, we were in Afghanistan in like 2005 and he, he was on a face, not a FaceTime, like a Yahoo messenger back yeah. then. And so he seen my wife, Kathy, which was like, he's like, so cool. He got to see my wife, you know, that was a big deal for him. He's like, and my wife's like, keep my husband safe. And he's like, I took that personal. And then he's, he went, so because of that, he wanted me to meet Hatra, which is like, you don't do. Yeah. 100%. Afghan don't do much less an American. Yeah. And so like, there's this real awkward moment where he's like, he's like real nervous. I'm like nervous. Cause he's nervous. He has me in his house and Hatra's like all covered up and she like, like down that hall, right? She just pops out, shows her, shows herself, and jumps back in, and it's like a big deal. And like that's how, that's that's how I first met Hatra. Other than that, she cooked behind the wall for us, and, and so like it was a big deal. Yeah, you're like, never even there in their presence. You're not even in the same room. No, no. So like, that's how I met her. And so over the years, I, I get glimpses of her and stuff like that. And uh, and then and then he got closer and closer to where I'd we'd be just in his house, and let me she'd walk in the same room. That's a big deal. So when we rescued them and um and got and uh, got them to. By the way, shout out to the. Uh, PJ team, they're the ones that actually grabbed them, took them through the wire. Amazing guys. And one day, one day we'll be able to share like who all those guys were. But uh, got them to Abu Dhabi. I met them in Abu Dhabi. He comes hug me. I start crying. His kids run up, hug me. They call me Uncle Chad. I start crying again. Oh, and then man. in the corner, back behind the room, is Hatra, where their face shown and puts her hand over her heart, you know, the Afghan gesture. Yeah, yeah. But, but staying on the other side of the room, keeping her distance, like in good Afghan culture, right? And, and every time I see them in the humanitarian center, she's still sitting in that back corner. Well, when they were in my driveway, I came back from Ukraine and they're waiting in my driveway for me to get back. I, I, I like darted from when they landed. I, I came from uh, from Kharkiv, like in the front lines, no shower. I'm like, man, I'm flying back to the States when they're playing with no shower. I've like had a shower in like, like 15 days, <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but I ended up getting a shower luckily, but I wouldn't have if I'd have missed the plane. So I, I flew back, man, I'm in my, in my driveway, pull up and there, there they are. And, uh. It's just so cool, like little um, mosh chorus playing with my my dog running around the front, my front yard. I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy's running around my front yard. And Aziz is there, and he runs up and gives me a hug. And uh, and mosh Kor, like the little boy, you know, hug, hugs me around the waist. And behind him is uh, Hatra, and she comes up and wraps her arms around me. Oh and wow! And gives me a huge hug, and she says, and she said, "Thank you, brother." Like, and uh, that was like 17 years in the making. Man, it was so profound, like for her to to do that now like now we're like she's like hilarious like she's like the craziest personality she's so funny like yeah. we joke she's laughing she doesn't all the have time. to wear she doesn't wear the traditional no she, she wears her over her head but she kind of where you can see her hair she kind of has it back a little bit like yeah. more like stylist like she's used to it yeah but she's like you know she's totally like yeah she's like cutting up accepting having fun. western culture oh yeah so much fun like i took her to see i didn't she's scared she never, kabul didn't have trees so it's the first time she'd ever been out of kabul and so she, all the trees in Texas, she's like, thanks to this jungle and something's going to come out and eat her. So I like messing with her and I took her, I took her to the movies cause these was out of town. I took her and the kids to the movies. I took them to see Jurassic Park. And she was like, she was like, Oh, she, she was has like, nightmares. <laughs> oh, <yeah. it> <laughs> she thought it was real. I was like, so it was just so fun. We have a lot of fun, man. She's, she's super cool. And she's been cooking all kind of Afghan food I miss. Oh my gosh, man. But yeah. That's okay. so amazing. But yeah. in, in the highlight of all this, all these amazing things, there's still there's still a tragedy here, right? There's still a lot of people who have been left behind, right? Yeah, I mean, like, like I've said that before, like we get we get a lot of pats on the back and accolades. I just got the I got an award from Congress. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, I got I got the Bonhoeffer Achievement Award from Glenn Beck. It came out like the fourth person. Get, I'm like those things. I mean, it's, it would be lying if it's not cool to get thank yous, right? I mean, everybody's like, oh, humbly, like it's it's cool to get recognized, but it's hard to because one, it wasn't me. There was so many amazing people. And two, those are 17,000 people that sound like a lot. 40 million people are still there. 80,000 of our interpreters are still there. 300,000 with their families have been lied to. Uh, our government re re uh, recanted their, their promise to them. They're going to be killed. Like 17,000 is a lot, but it's a, it's a drop in the bucket. And, uh, and, 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 you know, we didn't talk about the, the, the river operation, but, um, there was some tragedy there in the book, and I didn't. I didn't just write the the hero stories in the book. I didn't just write the victories. I wrote about some of the failures too. The, some of the things that we, you know, the three hundred kids that we were trying to get from an orphanage that couldn't get a mile. They had a mile more to go, and we had to. I had to tear that board paper off the wall and throw it away to move on. Uh, these three hundred human lives, and then this family of this commando and his wife, his pregnant wife, and right across that river when we were we were swimming across the river in Afghanistan every night. Me and Dennis Price. Uh, you were supposed to be there. Yeah, I know. I, you guys sent me the updates. <laughs> but but uh, you know, we didn't get them across, man. And and I could I could I could have yelled at them across the river, and uh, 
God, man. You know, what, what, how, what came of, of them? Unknown? I don't know. I mean, we, we moved back to Kabul, Kabul to, uh, everybody gave us, you know, people involved that gave us a hard time. You guys left them. I mean, uh, it's easy to say when you're on outside of that situation, but you know, we, you know, we, me and Dennis, me and Dennis kind of to give you a highlight of that when, you know, when, when we knew we couldn't fly people out anymore, we knew we still had to do something. So, uh, we knew that the people were moved all moved to the Panjir Valley. Thousands of people moved to the Panjir Valley and they wanted to cross into Tajikistan. But anybody that knows that geography, those mountains are 25,000 foot peaks. Yeah. The Chinese military secured that border. The Russian military was on that border. Uh, the Taliban had secured that border. Even if you made it through the, the geography of it, you might get to, through a valley with a family moving for a week, navigate all the Taliban checkpoints and then run into a thousand foot cliff or a category five, the Panjir River is category five in some parts. Ice melt, like literally if the water stops moving, it freezes, it's slushy uh, water, even in, the, even in the summertime because it's all like snow melt. And so like to get there and be able to navigate across is impossible. So you need somebody to come from the other side and build routes across. That's what, you know, and that's one of the things that as a reconnaissance Marine, it was one of four recon missions was doing four reps, uh, forward and route reps. And so I uh, took Dennis Price out. You know, that's the one you were supposed to come on. And uh, Dennis Price and I went, uh, he's a pretty crazy story how Dennis Price went because he's a he's an ASO uh, level three guy who was at a he was at JSOC Fort Street Marine at JSOC at that the, the, the Ranger unit um, and uh, what's what's that unit again the, RRC yeah he yeah. was he was there and uh, and, it, and he's like one of the most qualified scout snipers I know like next to you know you guys like you know Kevin and like I mean he's he's taught it I, he's probably the only guy I know that I ever heard of that's taught at SF non-SF guys t- taught an SF sniper course. Oh, nice. Uh, he's taught at a British yeah, SF sniper rare. course. Yeah. And uh, so he's like really, really high level guy. And he had just went from active duty reserves. And so I reached out to Lieutenant Colonel Waller, who was the commander of Third Force Recon Company. And I said, hey, this Staff Sergeant Dennis Price, uh, Marine has some specific skill sets like use them in a humanitarian mission. I know the military is not allowed to be involved right now, but it's any way you guys could give them, like leave the absence and allow them to be involved. He's like, He's a friend of mine, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Waller is. He's like, I don't know. Let's write a letter and ask. And so we did, and he got approved. And uh, and the Marine Corps cut him loose to go. And and so he came out there. That was me and him. And we ended up uh, going down to that border and did a uh, then ten days. We did a uh, ten days of route recon, and uh, and every night we swam across the river into Afghanistan. And it was Chinese military there, Russians, uh, Taliban, of course, and uh, built routes out and did all the fording reps to give to some of our government agencies that wanted the information because our government agencies, you know, by proxy use civilians to get information like that. We gave that to government agencies. We gave them to all the NGOs in that area and, uh, and then to the people on the other side to get routes out and, uh, some pretty crazy scenarios and wrote all about it in the book and during that time, but it was a pretty crazy, uh, 10 days. Uh, and, um, you know, we didn't go there to rescue people and get them across the river. We went there to provide information. A lot of people didn't understand that people that, don't understand operations would throw a lot of stones at us because they were, didn't understand, you know, they don't understand that world and what we're doing. Like the information is more important than taking one per people across. Yeah. But we did try to get help a family get across and it would have put them at the, at the 11th hour, like right when they were about to cross, we, we had some things happen that would have put them in more danger if we crossed them than, than not cross them. And we had to choose not to. And, uh, mm. and it was heartbreaking, man. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's the one heart, one of the most heartbreaking moments that I had in all this. With with all the things that are said, especially with the criticism, um, which is to be expected, I, I I think I've changed my tune, on my understanding of criticism. Uh, how optimistic are you about the future? Because all the things that I see, as somebody who owns a company specializing in preparedness, um, you know, with an AFO background, an OPE background. Uh, operational preparation of the environment like my brain and my skill sets are programmed for predicting the future based on the information that i'm i'm pulling extracting yeah. I, I i can't tell you that i'm super optimistic about the future of this country uh whether it's policies tactics strategy all the way down to the the ground level what's your take on that I, I'm right there with you. It's I'm, I'm a pretty optimist. I always like to see the, the even if even if it's a glimmer. I always say if it, man, the darker things are, the the easier it is to see a spark, right? If we're mm-hmm. if we're out in the daylight and you light and you flicker a match, you're not gonna see it. But if you're in a dark room and pitch black and you strike a match, it's bright as heck, you know. Uh, and, uh, and and it's pretty dark right now, and and I find it hard to to see that 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 spark. You know, it's a, uh, I mean, if if 
you know, I know this is, seems like conspiracy to see it to a lot of people. Uh, it doesn't to me. But if we cannot control and have integrity of our election system, then the same thing happens in every other country in the world that you and I have seen that lose control of their election system. The people don't have a voice anymore and, and elitists take over. And, uh, and if we can't control our election system in the United States, um, the people don't have a voice anymore in, uh, in this country's, you know, over, uh, over as we know it. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying that we're going to be speaking Chinese next week or anything, but I mean, it's over as we know it. Yeah. And our way of life is over as, as we know it. And everything that you and I uh, served for is lost. And, uh, and, and we are at a dangerous point in our country right now where that's actually not uh, pessimistic talk or, or not conspiracy. That's, that's actually it's happening. It's happening. Yeah. And, and if we don't, if we don't wake up and, and start uh, using our voices and platforms to speak out about these things, uh, then and then it's going to be gone, and we're going to be like, how, "How did we lose it? We lost it because we didn't speak up, we didn't prepare, we didn't." Uh, and that's why this book's so important to me. I, I was doing, I was writing an influencer letter today, and I'm like, <laughs> in the influencer letter, I'm like, "This isn't about selling books. It's about people have to know what's going on so they can be informed, so they can make the right decisions uh, when it comes to." Uh, what they're going to speak up about, what their positions could be on things, how they're going to vote, um, you know, where they're going to serve. Mm. I mean, I mean, everybody's everybody's worried about who's who's in the president, who's, who's in the Oval Office. What about who's who's running your school board? If, if there's nobody, if there's nobody that's going to represent your 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 school board, then go serve in the school board. I just had a friend that's just a, a mom who's been concerned forever, and she she put her name on the ballot and and she won, <laughs> like. She's like, this isn't okay for my kids. Like, my kids don't need to be taught this stuff. And she's complaining. She's like, I could complain. I could complain. I could complain. I don't know anything about politics. I've been a house mom my whole life, but I know it's right and wrong. She put her name on the ballot and she won. Um, I know everybody's an expert at identifying problems, but nobody's willing to offer, especially with themselves, the solution. And mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff that we talk about is is fixable, especially yeah. at the local level. You know, stop focusing on the federal government. Focus on your household. Yeah. Focus on fixing your own community and we'll be a better country for it. I mean, a lot of people have gone down rabbit holes and they virtue signal all the time on social media, um, but they're not willing to like stand up in their everyday life to fix it. Well, it's like Afghanistan, right? I mean, I have a platform. Uh, uh, I, have, I have a social platform and I have a lot of access to media. I could have stayed home uh, in August and I could have just moaned and complained and bashed the bashed the White House about Afghanistan withdrawal, and sat in my, you know, had my suit coat on and my pajama pants on, <laughs> sat by my desk and did and did the media every day, uh, but that wouldn't have changed anything. Yeah. Or or I could have packed my backpack and got on a plane, and headed over there and uh, called a couple of my friends, yeah. and rallied support and, and and did what I could. I mean, sometimes we have to stand up and sometimes we have to just get out and do something. It doesn't have to be an Afghanistan level size thing like we did, but it could be right there in your home, right there in your community. Uh, you know, when, when these things present themselves to you and you got an opportunity to write, you got an opportunity to do the right thing, mm. then, then you, you got to do it. Yeah, man. I'm proud to know you, Chad. It's um, amazing and inspiring. And it's not like we're talking in reflection. I mean, these are things that you're doing every single day. Um, we're going to continue to talk about the um, things that you're involved with in the Mission Resilience podcast. I want to focus on Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, we'll have the link down below for you as this drops. So you guys can migrate to see that um, because Chad is involved in a lot, especially when it comes to humanitarian crisis that are affecting the global, you know, people who can't help themselves across the world. Um, tell us about this book. When does it come out? Uh, how can people get into it? Well, uh, it comes out January 17th. So it's next week. And, um, uh, we're going to be, uh, it's available right now in pre-sale any, at any major book outlet, uh, Amazon's a uh, super easy place to get it. And, uh, it's, it's doing really well. I think it's number one on Amazon right now in a couple of categories. And, um, uh, it hasn't even come out yet. Hadn't even come out yet. Yeah. Did you do the audible recording? I did. I did. I didn't want to, <laughs> yeah. uh, everybody kept asking me to do it. I'm like, do you guys know I'm from Louisiana? Like, <laughs> man, that is the hardest thing. Writing the book's because because in your mind you know what you what you so you want to say things yeah that's not on paper it was pretty hard to and do. you had to stick to the script you got to stick to the script yeah Ooh, that's gonna it be tough it took, for me. Four, it took four days really uh, it took four days to do it yeah four, about, four like eight eight nine hour days i'm about to do that now in house they're allowing me to do it yeah. uh, on the equipment that i have yeah. and it scares me because i'm the same way like there's 
I always want to emphasize context yeah. yep. around words. Yeah. And I, cause I hear it and I'm like, oh, well they don't know that. Yeah, I got I to gotta fill it in. Yeah, I got to fill in the blanks. Yeah, yeah it, it was it was tough. But yeah, so it's on Audible. Uh, you can get an Audible uh, hardback, paperback, come out months later. And uh, and I'm allowed to say this now. I just can't say all the details, uh, but it's already picked up for a motion picture film. Um, oh, awesome. As a matter of fact, uh, a bunch of producers reached out to the publisher and they put them in touch with me. And uh, we had some really big studio offers, which we turned down because we wanted more control. Uh, and it's going to be you know about a 25 to $30 million dollar project so oh, it's wow. a pretty pretty um you know good good size budget for a film and uh it's important the story is told yeah uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm i'm super proud to have been involved in it um uh, man you know some amazing people you know glenn beck severado nick pomachano uh tim kennedy c spray all, all the people we can't say my son hunter was, was super involved and all the people we you know a lot of people can't say their names like um joe roberts another one can mention and a couple other sean's but so many and so many other amazing organizations in the book. I really tried to give a lot of credit to the other organizations as well. Yeah, uh, I did make a mistake though, and in, in, in the book, and and I, I, I want to mention it here because I never had mentioned it anywhere yeah. yet. So you know Dave Eubanks, Free Bear Rangers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the most incredible human beings on the planet. Yeah, he's, of course. He's like my like people ask like who my idol is. Yeah, Hall of like, Fame Ranger. Is it, it, Jesus and, and Dave Eubanks. <laughs> like, like, like Dave Eubanks is one of the most incredible human beings and he helped a lot in Tajikistan. And so we get there and he introduces us to another organization and these guys are pretty cool guys but they were super territorial because they couldn't get to H. Kaya and they were mad at us. Yeah. And so I mentioned that in the book. Well, somehow in editing, it got mixed up to say Free Burma Rangers was super territorial and it made it all the way through editing into print. And Dave read it and he's like, he called me up. He's like, brother, like if you had an issue, you could have just told me. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you read that wrong. I went back and read it. I was like mortified. Like, yeah. cause it, cause it said that. So I got the prints getting redacted. I fixed it in an audible. And, uh, and so Dave, I'm sorry. Everybody knows that free Burma Rangers, me and my wife, like me and my wife don't give to Mighty Oaks cause it, I'm going to give them all my organization. They're the organization I give to like yeah. financially free Burma Rangers is one of the most incredible organizations. Dave Eubanks is one of the most incredible human beings. I made a mistake in the print. If you get the print that says they're territorial, that's it the, wasn't them. It wasn't them. They most opposite of territorial Dave Eubanks is the most incredible human being awesome I'm glad so. we set the record straight <laughs> yep. Rangers lead the way um, <laughs> yeah, Rangers lead the way and Dave Eubanks is, is, leads the way for Rangers man he's yeah he's, he's the man, man. Uh, I want to say um, so it's how the mission to help one became a calling to save thousands saving disease by Chad Robichaud. Uh that link is down below as well in the notes um, I want to say thank you Chad for making the trip man man thanks so much yeah uh, awesome, awesome to be here with you yeah it's it's been amazing and stay tuned for the next podcast which is mission resilience if you're listening to this and check out all the links and follow that everything is chad's doing we'll have links to his social media his website also his nonprofit, mighty oaks foundation thanks guys that concludes today's training any questions Woo! drum titties boy <laughs>